So I'll give a very quick introduction to Dr. Marge Skubik. She has been my former master's as well as my PhD advisor. She's also the director for the Center for Elder Care and Rehabilitation Technology at the University of Missouri. This is a huge interdisciplinary team comprising nursing, social work, physical therapy, sports medicine, health informatics. Am I missing any? Um, yeah, we have some new ones now. Okay. Artificial <laughs> therapy and uh, several more people in medicine. And so, yeah. yeah, and it's a huge, uh, uh, I mean, huge center, and they have uh, a lot of projects primarily focused on proactive health. In the past, it has been on fall risk and fall detection, but now I know you've moved into screening for athletics and pianists as well, so there are a lot of other different applications. So without further ado, Dr. Matt Skovic. Thank, Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, thanks for inviting me. So I'm going to focus this on the elder care technology, and uh, this is the name of the talk, Squaring the Life Curve. Helping Lou and Mary Ann age in place. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by squaring the life curve, and I'll also introduce you to Lou and Mary Ann. So here's Lou and Mary Ann. They live in South Dakota. They, uh, this picture was taken a few years ago uh, when they were, um, I think Mary Ann was probably around, oh, maybe 87 and Lou was probably around 90 or so. They're from Minnesota. Um, they like polka music. And so for a long time, they would go around to the senior housing facilities and entertain for the old folks. But um, he really does play the accordion, and she really does play the drums. And if you haven't guessed, this is my mom and dad. <laughs> So I'll show you some more pictures. So they're kind of my inspiration for much of this work. So let me also explain squaring the life curve. Um, any of you familiar with that term? Do you know what I mean? Oh, you don't count, right? Of course, of course, Tanby knows. So when we first started working with the nursing, and initially this started uh, with Marilyn Rance, who's a professor in nursing, um, the nurses talked about the typical trajectory of functional decline in this stair-step fashion, where people would go on a plateau for a while until something dramatic happened, and then it would drop them down quite dramatically to the lower level until the next big thing happened, where it would drop them down again. And so our hypothesis was that if we could recognize the beginning of that decline, or even better, predict when that decline was likely to occur, that an intervention could be offered at just the right time and help keep that functional ability up high. So we never um, asserted that we would actually extend people's life, per se, but it was all about extending their quality of life. Some, all, some people also call this the health span. So you notice that this sort of ends at the, at the end at the same time, but we wanted to keep people up at this high level of functionality. And then, and then at the end, you know, they go fast, you don't have this sort of lingering uh, low functionality. So that ends up speaking a lot to quality of life and also um, independence. It gives people options. And if you have this higher level of functionality, it also facilitates the ability to age in place. What, and what we mean by that is that you have the option of where you want to age, whether it's in the home that you've lived in for the last 50 years, or it's a, another home of your choosing, but you get to have choices over what that looks like. So we started out um, with this premise that if we put sensors in people's homes, we could maybe detect early, very, very early signs of health changes so that we would then be able to introduce very early interventions to help people keep people up at that high level of functionality. So um, we've developed a system which is really a clinical decision support system. It recognizes um, uh, health, it helps 
changes, sends out health alerts, uh, as also recognizes falls and sends out alerts for those too. And typically it's nurses and social workers that receive these alerts. And then we rely on them to figure out what's a, a timely and appropriate intervention. So just to reiterate this, what we're talking about here is detecting health changes using what I like to call opportunistic sensing. The nurses convinced us a long time ago not to put sensors on seniors because of the issue of, of the compliance and having to worry about charging them and all the other complications. Um, they wanted these to be embedded in the environment. And so we, we went about creating a system where the seniors don't have to wear anything. In fact, they don't have to do anything at all. In fact, we would prefer that they forget that the system is there so that they just go about their normal, act, normal everyday activity and we capture their normal behavior. But even if you give that premise, there's some relevant questions that have to be answered. So first of all, what kind of information could we extract from sensors in the home that would actually be clinically <coughs> meaningful? And that brings up questions about what kind of sensors should we have, what kind of features should you extract from these sensors, what level of abstraction is appropriate to be able to achieve this kind of information. Then there's also the issue of how do we detect very early health changes. As we've seen over the years, these patterns that people have that they develop are all different. And seniors especially, you know, al almost all of them have some kind of chronic health condition. But in fact, o over half of them have multiple chronic health conditions. And so they interplay in interesting, er interesting ways such that these trajectories and these typical patterns and behaviors can oftentimes be quite different from one person to the next. So it requires that you have to figure out how to learn some kind of a personalized pattern um, so that you can use that then to be able to detect these very early health signs. So how do you go about doing that, especially in a very noisy environment such as the home? And then, the third question here, how do we facilitate the early interventions? Well, one, one big question that comes to mind is, how do you display this information about the health changes, and who do you display it to? You know, what's the format that it should take, and who's the best people to actually receive this information and act on it? So what I'm going to show you today is a little bit of an evolution of the system that we have developed over the years. And you'll see that we're going to sort of float through these different questions here. As, it, and I, I, as I reflect back on the development that we've done now since 2005, um, we've taken sort of an iterative path in this. So we've kind of floated back around these different questions. So much of this work was done at Tiger Place. Um, this, of course, is named after the University of Missouri mascot. We're, we're tiger crazy in Columbia, Missouri. Um, it's a 54-apartment senior housing complex, a true aging in place facility and it actually required a couple of rounds of legislation at the state level in order to make that possible. But people can stay there through the end of life, including uh, receiving hospice care, regardless of what their, um, their functional level is. So the nursing school at the university um, recruited AmeriCare to build this facility, and they also operate the housing uh, part of it and the meal part of it. But the clinical component is handled by the nursing school. And, and that has given a lot of flexibility in some of the different research that we can accomplish there. So this is the first place that we deploy these systems. Then we've branched off into other areas as well. Um, 
including other senior housing facilities in the Missouri area. We've also done some in Iowa. We've done some private homes scattered around as well. So as we've done this research, now you notice, um, maybe I didn't point this out, when we first proposed this model of the stair-step fashion you know, trajectory and trying to square the life curve, that came out in an article in 2005. And 10 years later, we finally had done enough research. Um, we got another article published in 2015 that had some results that show that maybe we can actually accomplish this. Um, so in Tiger Place, because of this unique facility, the uh, residents there are able to get a, a, an extraordinarily good nursing care model delivered. And so, in fact, this is part of the purpose of Tiger Place was, in fact, to investigate different ways of handling nursing care as well as explore the technology. Um, we have um, uh, more assessments that are done with the residents there so that it becomes sort of a living laboratory of sorts. Uh, everybody that moves into their place actually signs a consent that says that their research, that their uh, records, their medical records can be used for research purposes. And by the way, nobody has balked at that either. <laughs> right? Everybody has signed that. So that's allowed us to go back and do research. So, so here's a couple of data points. Tiger Place residents that did not have sensors installed, and, and we always keep some control groups there, were able to stay almost a year longer than seniors in comparable uh, US housing because of the uh, advanced care model that they got. But then if you look at the additional benefit of the sensors, those people were able to stay 1.7 years longer just if they had the sensors. So you got another bump up on that. And that, we believe, is because of the fact that we were able to recognize these early signs of health problems and be able to deliver early interventions. Is there a question? What do you mean by stay longer? Like live longer? They, so we're not tracking the length of life we're tracking the length of stay in Tiger Place, in this sort of independent living kind of environment. The full hospice? Um, Nursing home. No, it might be it, because they can stay there through hospice as well. What are some reasons that they might leave then? So there are, um, there are a variety of reasons why somebody might leave. Uh, I can recall um, instances where people have had cognition problems where you know, Tiger Place is not set up with a memory care unit for severe cognition problems. Now, there are people there that have some level of cognitive problems, but if it got to be too severe, that might cause people to, to leave. Some people end up leaving because they go live with a family member. Um, some people do go live in a skilled nursing home, but not very many of them. So there's a variety of different reasons. Is there another question? But, but we have found that, that these sensors with the health alert system in place has allowed us to address these health problems very early. And that has allowed um, better health outcomes. And so I'll show you some other examples with that, too. So when we first started, um, we used some pretty simple sensors. We used uh, passive infrared motion sensors, the, the kind that are commercially available that would be used in surveillance systems. And we put them all over the place, including um, on the ceiling over the shower or on the ceiling over the front door. We also had a, a bed sensor that we used that was a pneumatic strip that went on top of the mattress. Um, it only gave you qualitative pulse and respiration, like low, normal, or high, and then some level of restlessness. And then there was a stove uh, temperature sensor as well, although it turned out that not very many people used that because they had excellent 
cooking, you know, chefs at, at uh, Tiger Place and could get their meals there. And so a lot of people uh, ended up there because they really didn't want to cook, and so they didn't end up cooking that much. So let me introduce you to Eva. Um, Eva was one of our early participants in the study. And we were still trying to figure out what, um, what to look at for the sensor data. But she was the one, our very first case of being able to recognize prospectively a health problem so that we could get a, a change done on it. And what happened, um, Eva had developed, well, first of all, Eva had congestive heart failure. And she had developed this pattern of going in and out of the hospital. You know, she would be admitted to the hospital because of her heart failure problems. They'd fix her up, they'd send her back to Tiger Place, and a little bit later, she'd end up back in the hospital again. And she had this continuous back and forth cycle. And we were looking at her research uh, sensor data one day. We would, we, well, we've had, um, for years now, we've had our research meetings in Tiger Place. So we're all sitting in this meeting room in Tiger Place looking at the sensor data. And all of a sudden, uh, Dr. Rance, the nursing professor, gets up and says, oh, I know what's going on. Eva's heart failure is acting up again. We need to get her medication changed or she's going to end up back in the hospital again. And so she runs down to Eva's apartment, and I kind of ran after her because I wanted to see what the heck she was going to do. And there was another nurse in there that was assessing her, and the two nurses were talking to each other, and they agreed that, yes, um, Eva's heart failure was acting up again. And the other nurse said, but the doctor won't change her medication because um, she hasn't gained enough weight. Right, there are standard population-based protocols that they follow, and she hadn't gained the, you know, the required number of pounds for him to change the medication level. And Marilyn said, get him on the phone, I want to talk to him. And I, so I sat there while she basically badgered this poor physician <laughs> to death um, and, and convinced him that, she need, that he needed to change the level of medications for Eva. And he did finally do that, and that broke the cycle of rehospitalization because she was able to get this change that she needed, and she never went back in the hospital again because of her heart failure. What Marilyn found, by the way, Which is, sensor was this? Excuse me? Which was bed? bed. The bed sensor. The right? bed sensor, yeah. So what Marilyn found is that she was getting up in the middle of the night. In fact, you, if you look back at the pattern, um, she was getting up earlier and earlier at night. And at the time, we didn't know exactly what she was doing, although we guessed that she was sitting in a recliner chair for the rest of the night. But you could tell that she was getting up early and early and spending less and less time in bed. And this is classic for people that have heart failure. They can't lie flat because they can't breathe. And so they'll often uh, sit in recliner chairs, sleep in recliner chairs. But this is what we saw prospectively, and, and we were able to change it then. So this is the problem with these population-based protocols, is that they're based on an average person. But in fact, nobody's average, right? Everybody's unique. And so you need something that that, that takes that into account. So this is a system that we ended up developing where we would take in sensor data, uh, learn a pattern for an individual, and recognize then when that pattern began to deviate and send out health alerts to the clinical staff. And then they uh, would do the care coordination. You know, they would take, um, take into account the sensor data and the other information about the clinical case and to determine whether an intervention was warranted. So this is what one of the early emails looked like. We had several links included in there where uh, we would have just a kind of a basic um, explanation of the alert and then we'd have a link that would take you into a website where you would open this up and you could interactively look at all the sensor data 
Um, we also had a feedback loop from the clinicians that we had. We asked them to rate the alert so that we use that then um, in training the algorithms and assessing the algorithms. And then we had developed our own electronic health record. By the way, this is an insane proposition. I don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. But um, that did give us the ability then to link to the EHR to try and streamline the workload of the clinical staff. So this is one of the alerts that we had received. Um, this had to do with uh, bathroom activity at night. So this is a bathroom chart, just a visualization that let the clinical staff look at this. Each column represents one day, and it goes from midnight at the top to 11 p.m. at the bottom. And each of these red lines here indicates time in the bathroom. So you see there, uh, this particular person was not getting up and using the bathroom in the middle of the night, but then suddenly developed this pattern and eventually an alert was generated and it turned out to be a urinary tract infection. And those are pretty easy to fix if you get them early enough. If you don't get them early, they can present in all sorts of complicated ways. Here's another example of using motion sensor data in what we call a density map. So again, um, each column represents one day starting from midnight at the top to 11 p.m. at the bottom. And here you've got three different snapshots of time periods. And we use the black to indicate the time out of the apartment. And then the color is used to indicate the amount of activity. Uh, white and gray is a very low amount of density. And then yellow is higher and uh, blue goes up to the highest. And by density here, what we're doing is actually counting up the motion sensor events and dividing by some unit of time. And so this visualization shows you um, the changes that happen in this particular individual uh, as a result of depression. Initially, this depression was being managed, but then there was a period of time when that created the problem. And then after an intervention, you see uh, increased activity. During this middle period, though, this individual had pretty much stopped leaving the apartment altogether. A pretty dramatic change. So some of the changes that we detected using, these, using this um, approach with these relatively simple centers, um, in addition to the urinary tract infections, you know, pneumonia and, and other uh, respiratory infections, the uh, congestive heart failure, as I mentioned, uh, pain, post-hospitalization, delirium, low blood sugar. But it used a very simple model of early illness recognition that could generalize across these different health problems. However, what we found is that about 50% of those alerts turned out to be false alarms. Now, even with that, the clinicians were thrilled because they had never had this kind of data before. And they, in fact, they had um, decided that they wanted to keep the system running uh, even when the study ended. So we did some more analysis of this, again, using this feedback loop that the clinicians had defined, where they defined uh, which of these alerts are good versus which ones are bad. And this is a... Um, a PCA reduction of six-dimensional feature space. And what we found is that, that the good days, which are dis, uh, displayed here in red, tend to cluster um, around the middle of the cluster. And the abnormal days, where you would want alerts, tend to be outliers of this cluster. It's not completely the case that that happens because this is a very noisy environment, but this turned out to be a reasonably good model of how to look at this idea of, of what days should be alerted on versus what days should not be alerted on, assuming that you have the adequate um, sensor feature space to use. And, and so when we did this work now, we changed it from this very simple um, system, which was basically a collection of 1D classifiers. We changed it into a, a 6D classifier, 
and we were able to up the classification rate from about 50% to about 85% using the same features, but now considering all of these together. So that if you had, you know, a little bit of this change and a little bit of that change and a little bit of that change, you know, that it, that it could um, extend farther away from this cluster center and eventually then think of this as an outlier that would be the kind of situation where you would want to generate an alert. But in the end, we decided we really needed better features. This is a relatively simple sensor system. So we started looking at what other sensors we could use. Um, uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, could you please provide some sample of these classes? This is a two-class um, problem. This is uh, good alerts versus bad alerts. So it, it goes back to this situation here. Which ones were considered to be valid alerts versus which ones were not good alerts because they were actually good, good normal days. So it's, it's simply a two-class classification problem. So you had the motion sensor and bed sensors as the raw data for those. Yes, but we would extract features out of these. Um, from the bed sensor data, we would get uh, different features that would so relate to the, um, the pulse rate, like low normal high uh, pulse rate, low normal high uh, respiration rate, and then restlessness. So you don't have any situation on glasses, um, what's no, this does not involve activity recognition. This is looking at more coarse types of measurements. Um, so in the end, you know, <coughs> driven by some of the clinical expertise, um, we looked at things like um, if you have increased activity during the nighttime when you really should be sleeping, you know, that could be cause for alarm. If you have uh, increased activity during the daytime hours, you know, that was considered to be a positive thing. So, so the idea was to, to be able to recognize, well, well, again, we were learning what's a, a typical pattern for an individual. So we didn't make any assumptions about what was the correct level of activity that somebody should have. We're more looking for changes in that level when, when it starts to deviate. <coughs> But it's more the direction of the change that becomes important. Does that answer the question? For, uh, for each individual, you train separately. Yeah. So for each, this is for each individual. Yeah. It has to do with um, with a learning learning a model. I would suggest. Uh, if, if you want to talk more later, we can do that, and there is a paper here that describes this, and all these papers are on our website, but we, I can point you to that, too. We can talk more later about exactly how that was done. Is there another question? Yes. Excuse me, and would you mind to explain more about the, how you measure depression? Uh, what was the uh, sensor data that you... So the, the depression, well, first of all, there's a number of clinical assessments that are made. So there is a, you know, a clinical assessment that lets people diagnose and uh, measure depression clinically. Um, some of the, the sensor um, parameters that might go into the recognition of the depression are illustrated here in this, so less activity, less time away from home. But, but I should emphasize here that we weren't diagnosing any particular disease. We weren't diagnosing with these alerts saying you have depression or you have increasing depression. Um, these alerts were more in the form of there's something going on, take a closer look. You know, and that sort of nudge that we were giving to the clinical staff. Because of the fact that everybody had different conditions and, um, and different combinations of conditions, we didn't want to make a, um, a particular disease-driven model 
for any of these cases because we figured it, it needed to have a more personalized approach done. That, oh, oh my, more questions. Mm -hmm. I haven't even gotten to the really good sense for that. <laughs> All right, so when the pattern deviated and the work was given, did you also inform the clinicians what part of the pa uh, pattern deviated? Like, for instance, this one, they didn't leave the apartment for a month? Uh, yeah, so they were very simple like this, increase oh, yeah. in bathroom activity. <coughs> yeah, very, very simple. There was another question back here? Yes. So were there rules um, that were defined for each and every patient, uh, assuming that each and every patient are unique? No, th there were not individual rules defined. There <laughs> were... More of um, what we learned what was typical. We had a number of features that we were looking at, and we learned what was typical for each individual, and we actually ex um, extracted statistical parameters like the means and standard deviations of each of these. And so the alerts were based on um, the, the current day changing by a certain amount beyond what the mean of for that individual was for that parameter over the previous 14 days, and how much it changed to, to I mean, where how we determined how big of a change was um, warranting an alert was based on the standard deviation of those readings. So it became a really really simple model. Okay, so we decided we needed better sensors. So I'm going to talk specifically about a couple of them. One, um, we ended up ultimately using the depth images. The Microsoft Connect came out uh, about 2010, I think, 2011, and we started using those. Uh, we did not use the SDK for that to get the skeletal data, but we're using the depth images directly. And then we developed our own bed sensor that goes underneath the mattress that captures a quantitative measure of uh, pulse respiration and restlessness. So here's what the bed sensor signal looks like. It captures um, the ballistic cardiogram. Um, that is a, a measure of the force exerted on the body as a result of the blood flowing through the body. And you can get that through non-contact form. So you can have a transducer underneath the mattress that never touches the person, but you can capture this waveform that is actually a, a function of the cardiovascular system of the individual. And I've shown here what the ECG looks like, you're probably very familiar with that, versus the kind of signal that you get from uh, BCG. And this was very, very early work that was done by Isaac Starr in the 1940s. So it was um, quite old technology, but it's been resurrected recently because of the fact that you can get this information using this sort of passive sensing. So, uh, so let me just point out, so what you're seeing here in this 10 second signal is the superposition of the respiration and the ballistic cardiogram. So the higher amplitude, lower frequency signal is the respiration. And embedded in that is the high, um, higher frequencies, lower amplitude signal that is the ballistic cardiogram. So if you filter out the respiration, this is what the ballistic cardiogram looks like. And there's this prominent peak on, on young, healthy subjects that's called the J peak. And that's what we're point, uh, picking out here. We've developed several algorithms over the years. Um, this particular one was developed by Lisette Rosales, which uses a clustering approach. And you can see how, it's, uh, how it compares to the um, finger sensor that we're getting there. It does a nice job of picking that out. And here's the beat-to-beat -beat intervals between the finger sensor and the bed sensor. And then we've got this uh, depth data that we're using. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do, because of the population that we're working with, 
is we wanted to be able to assess whether somebody is at risk of falling. And a big way that you can do that is by capturing their gait. And, and in fact, um, it turns out that capturing gait changes also can tell you whether someone is having cognitive problems. So this shows a person walking in, in a Tiger Place apartment and that the uh, person is segmented out of that depth image and then we track how that person, how that segmented depth image <coughs> moves through the environment. And there's some very good papers that show how that's done, but, but just to give you a simple view, the lower part of the body is uh, cut off and projected down to the plane, the floor plane. And we use um, a model that, that tracks these gates here. It's a kind of like a sinusoidal pattern to get the left foot, left footfall and the right footfall. But from that, we can get um, walking speed, stride time, stride length. And we did a validation in the lab using a marker-based motion capture system. Uh, by the way, this is our physical therapy collaborator, uh, Dr. Carmen Abbott, with all the markers on her body, um, showing us what that looks like. So all this stuff has been validated in the lab first. So here's an example of, of a two resident apartment where we had uh, this depth sensor in the home capturing gait. So what's, each one of these dots in this uh, image here represents a segmented walk. So first of all, we segmented out um, the purposeful walks, not the ones where you're just you know, doing this small little motion here, because we wanted to get really a model of the gait. And so we, we had a particular um, constraint imposed on it that it had to be a certain length, it had to be a certain speed, and, and so forth. And so this, these purposeful walks are abstracted, but you see there's a lot of variation in them. But what we found is that uh, what typically happens, not always, but what typically happens is that you get a cluster formed for each of the residents. And, and this is actually done in four-dimensional space where we've got the, um, the walking speed, the height, the stride time, and the stride length. And so this model is then learned at, for each of the individuals and tracked over time so that you can get a model and, and be able to track their walking speed, their stride time, and their stride length over time. And this shows a picture of the connect that we had originally in the apartments back at the beginning when we were doing this work. So for that particular couple that we found there, oh, by the way, I should point out, so this is a husband and wife. The wife is much shorter than the husband. But they also had a lot of grandchildren that would come into the scene. And so you see all these really short people here are the grandchildren. But those are the outliers. So these visitors that come into the scene are the outliers. So those don't end up becoming part of the model. And they're not used in the tracking. So, you know, we've always been very careful to be respectful of these people. We didn't want streaming video in the home. People don't want that. I don't think people would allow that. Um, the advantage of the depth images are that what you just get a silhouette of the person. You get the shape. But it doesn't tell you their face. You know, it doesn't tell you if they uh, have made up their hair that day. It doesn't tell you what kind of clothes they have on. You know, older people are kind of sensitive about these things sometimes, right? Um, this just gives you the shape of the body, but with that you can capture these important um, parameters. So we're tracking these uh, cluster centers, and here's that particular case that I showed. This, um, when they moved into Tiger Place, this was a husband and wife where the husband was considered healthy and the wife had Parkinson's disease, and so they really moved in there because of the wife. Now, she was uh, receiving medication for her Parkinson's, and so over this time period, her gait pattern remained relatively stable. But what we observed is that her so-called healthy husband started having a decrease in his walking speed and actually a decrease in his stride length. And this became the first objective indication 
of his decline in cognition, he started taking shorter footsteps. So knowing this about this particular couple made all the difference in the world in terms of how the care would be delivered to them. Because it turned out that he was starting to get um, com combative with his wife. And so that they needed to have some way of being able to handle that. So, uh, was it possible to also kind of uh, give uh, an idea that uh, this allows you to be proactive in this way? For example, husband, you know, regular clinical thing might have picked up much later, and uh, would you know the physician probably would not have as much uh, fidelity uh, uh, in terms of information as this gives you. Were you able to kind of? Overly, this on the standard care uh, and, and how? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. It made a big difference in terms of the care that was delivered to this couple, in in a more holistic sense, right? Because it had implications both for the husband as well as the wife, hmm. and so they could figure out how to deliver the best care for them. Right, but were you able to put just this thing next to what would have been the standard care kind of thing where? Uh, something serious has to happen before the physician would see this person? Um, yeah, so let me show you some later work where we did a sort of a predictive analysis on this um, over several years worth of people. But yeah, so, so the other thing that you would like to know is you, as you start to see uh, changes in gait, you'd like to be able to, to use that um, especially if it ends up showing that they have a risk of falling, you'd like to be able to use that to try and overcome that fall. So, I, you know, I don't have a slide in here, but one of the other things that was done, so much of this work was done by uh, Eric Stone. And um, one of the things that he also did was to track the, um, the gait, the walking speed in the home, the average in-home walking speed, to a standardized fall risk assessment, which is known as the TUG, or the timed up and go. So we had uh, developed a protocol. This was done over a course of a couple years. We had 10 apartments at Tiger Place that were outfitted in, with a depth camera system. We also had two webcams that were extracting silhouettes and building a voxel model. And then we had a radar system as well. And we had all three systems in these 10 apartments for two years. Um, and uh, stunt actors would come into the apartment once a month and fall down. You know, we trained them how to fall like old people. There was, we have a paper on this if you're interested. It's like 20 different kinds of falls. And then we also ha had a researcher come into the apartment and guide the um, subjects, the, the residents, through a series of standardized fall risk assessment instruments. And there are about six of them that include things like the timed up and go and the habitual bait and <laughs> habitual gait, the um, SPPB, which is the short physical performance battery. Uh, there's, so there's a, there are a Berg balance scale. Right? There's a whole set of standardized um, assessments that were done and then he ended up mapping the average in-home gait speed to each of these assessments and found that um, the best, the, the, well, so I have to tell you the rest of the story. How much time do we have? <laughs> the, you might find this interesting. So um, we had been looking for the platinum standard for fall risk assessment instruments. You know, if you look at these so-called validated standardized instruments, they've all been validated on different populations. Some of them are validated on fairly frail uh, seniors, and some of them are validated on more active, you know, less frail seniors. And we had, we had sort of hypothesized that if we could find the assessment that correlated the best with every other assessment, that we would call that our platinum standard. And so um, what Eric did is, did this analysis where he compared all of the different pairs together to see which one had the highest um, correlation with all the other assessments. Well, it turns out that the timed up and go was the best, that 
that compared the best over to all these others. But if you put the average in-home gate speed acquired by the depth camera in the mix, then the average in-home gate speed was actually the best. And so we were thinking that maybe that's in fact our platinum standard, is that instead of having these episodal things, and, and no, most of the time you don't get them as often as once a month, um, maybe you get them once every six months or once a year. And of course the average in-home gate speed is built on lots and lots of walks. And so we think that that's a better match better a uh, better assessment. But what that does is then, since we had a mapping between the average in-home gate speed and the timed up and go, well the timed up and go has um, standardized uh, times that say based on a person's age you have a, a low, um, medium, or high risk of falling. And so now that gave us the ability to be able to map average in-home gate speed into the actual fall risk for a particular individual. And so that's the other way that we've used this assessment, is to be able to actually achieve a measure of fall risk without having somebody come into the lab. So uh, we also did an analysis where we looked at um, whether or not these parameters could be used to predict a likelihood of falling. And what we found is that if you have a decrease in walking speed of about five centimeters a week, a five centimeters a second over a week, that you have an 86% probability that you're going to fall within the next three weeks. And there's also um, another probability associated with stride length. But the walking speed is particularly compelling. And so this is a parameter that shows it's worthy of being monitored. So one of the other things that can be used to detect fall risk is how much someone sits and particularly um, how much, how difficult they, they have uh, of being able to go from a sitting position to a standing position. So this is some work that, um, that Dr. Banerjee did finally got the paper published, uh, some work where you see a sequence of somebody in the home beginning to rise. And again, this is done in very unstructured home settings. So one of the things that um, they did is to be able to learn, first of all, what's the so-called command chair in the home for an individual. Because they all have different homes, and if there's multiple people in the home, they probably have different command chairs. So we want to learn what's the command chair for the individual. Do you know what I mean by command chair? Right, the chair where they have their, they probably have a table on each side, and they got the television remote control, and they got their water glass, and they have a little snack or a cup of tea or you know whatever. But it's the chair that they sit in. Yeah, the telephone would be there too. You know. So you had to learn the command chair and then also recognize how much time they spent in that chair and then be able to, to detect um, how they did the sit to stand and that can be used as a measure also for tracking health. So in addition to tracking these different parameters, we also wanted to be able to capture when somebody fell down um, and so we did that and it also with these three different sensing modalities. At the end of the day, by the way, the depth camera won. And so now we've sort of uh, gone away with the, the other two systems and we use the, uh, the depth sensor itself. But we had set up a, um, a, a fall alert. So this has to happen uh, within about 30 seconds that the system has to recognize that a fall is, has occurred. And then we save a little short uh, depth video clip that gets sent out to a server so that the alert includes a link to that depth video so that you can immediately see what happened. And so here's some examples of falls that we caught in Tiger Place. Here's another one. This is kind of interesting. Wait. Wait, here it comes. 
So this particular individual um, had developed a pattern of falling a lot, and her because she had a neurological condition, her family thought she was tripping on her cat. I can tell you, I've watched every single one of these fall videos, and she never once tripped on her cat. The cat does come into the scene afterwards. But so this had an impact on being able to assure her family that no, she was not tripping on her cat. They wanted to get rid of her cat, and of course, she didn't want to get rid of the cat. So, But there are some false alarms that occur as well, and having that link there makes it nice so you can immediately <coughs> tell it's a false alarm. Here's one that really aggravates my nursing collaborators, uh, throwing linens on the floor. So this is a staff, of course, coming in to change the bed, throwing linens on the floor. So we did an analysis where we went back and looked at, um, there's a couple different ways of looking at the data. The first one was done with that individual that fell a lot. So this is about 600 days were at the top uh, table. She fell 142 times in 600 days. Um, I'm happy to report she did not break anything. Wow. But, but one of the things that she did is she, she learned how to fall slowly. She would brace herself as she was going down. Well, that had some implications in the recognition algorithms because we were recognizing not just that somebody was on the floor, but we recognized how they got onto the floor. We were looking at the acceleration of getting onto the floor. Well, this is yet another indication that the way old people fall is much different than the way young people fall. We ended up lowering her threshold on this so we could make sure that we caught all of them. So we had a little bit higher false alarm rate when we lowered the uh, threshold. This bottom table is built on a collective 10,000, over 10,000 days worth of data from about 67 apartments. And what's interesting here is to see um, the false alarms that were detected. So we have a false alarm rate of 1.4 per month per person, which is pretty good. About half of those false alarms were linens that were thrown on the floor by the staff. So we have some ideas on how to fix that. But. So today our false our, our uh, Today our alert for falls looks like this, and one of the things that we've added here is the ability to um, go back more in the past beyond this very short depth video clip that I just showed. And so we've got this rewind feature in here, so you can click on that and you can go back and review what happened. Because what we really want to know is not just did they fall, what happened leading up to the fall. Sometimes you can see that in the really short clip, and sometimes you can't, so this has the ability to rewind more. So you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, where, did you deploy the sensors elsewhere in the 67 places? Yes, oh. um, so that was part of an R01 study where we had deployed them in about a dozen other uh, senior housing sites in Missouri. Most of them were assisted living kinds of apartments. but outside of Tiger Brace. <clears throat> so here's another view of Lou and Mary Ann. Um, they have sensors in their home. For my mother's 93rd birthday in January, I installed sensors in their home. And so now you can see what the latest uh, depth sensor looks like. So we have a company that's uh, being run by one of my former PhD students. Of course, he's hired up. He's hired a lot of the other graduate students. I understand you have a, a similar history of this being done here. Um, but this is the depth camera system that they have developed now. That's the commercial version of this, and they have two bed sensors under their mattress, and so we we track their data. It's kind of interesting um, looking at your parents' data. You know, it's different than looking at somebody that is a research subject. So um, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to do this just so that I understand what that feels like. So I'll just show you some quick uh, recent work on this. So here's um, 
a chair sensor that we're developing because of the story I told you about Eva and the fact that many of these people uh, sleep in recliner chairs. We figured we needed to have a recliner chair. And so here's some, um, some data here on this which shows you the results, the comparative results between a finger sensor to get heart rate versus the chair sensor. And then this is a chest band to get the respiration rate and the chair sensor. So it's pretty good agreement. So we'd also like to get more out of the BCG. Um, you know, the ECG captures the function of the heart, but the BCG captures the function of the cardiovascular system. And so uh, we've gone back to Isaac Starr's studies, and he did quite a number of studies, including very longitudinal studies back in the 40s and 50s. And the way he measured the ballistic cardiogram was using a suspended bed. So we, um, I, I got inspired by this. I had a chance to see the original Isaac Starr suspended bed, which is then a lab in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I looked at that and I said, you know what, we can build one of those. And so we built one and our very first subject was Dr. Jim Keller. He laid down on the, the bed. And th so what this has done um, that's different from the bed sensor is it allows you to capture a multi-directional signal. So when somebody lies down on this bed, you get not only the vertical action like this along the trunk axis, but you get lateral movement as well. So you can actually see this bed swinging in an elliptical fashion. Besides, I was really intrigued. I said, what, you know, a person lies down on this bed and the bed swings as a result of the blood flowing through your body? So I, just, I had to see that. But yes, it really does work and you swing in this sort of elliptical pattern. And so now we're going back to some of this early work um, <coughs> with one of our new faculty members, uh, Dr. Gaboni and looking at modeling that um, ballistic cardiogram <coughs> function and see what other types of features we can use to track a more finely grained model of the cardiovascular system. Um, we're also looking at capturing activity sequences rather than static, you know, here's what's happening on this day versus that day versus that day. We're looking at sequences of activities and then one of the things that is particularly um, intriguing is to be able to take a whole bunch of data and turn it into something that is more meaningful, uh, you know, extract um, useful, hopefully clinically relevant data from it in a form that people can understand. And so we're exploring uh, the generation of linguistic summaries for the sensor data so here's one example, and, and I apologize, this is kind of small. From all of these graphs, this generated summary was done. In the past two weeks, there were many days with high bathroom and overall activity. Also, restlessness has been increasing for the past five days. And I'll show you another example. So we have, um, sometimes people get alerts and multiple parameters. And the clinicians didn't want to see a whole string of them like, here's this change, here's this change, here's this change. Um, so they said, well, let's just you know, put the number there and then have somebody look at the uh, interface and they can look at the graphs and see what's going on. And so some simple alert is that this particular individual has had six health alerts since Saturday, September 23rd. And now here, just go click on this interface link, and then you can see what's actually happening. But it's not very um, descriptive about what's really going on. So here's a, a new linguistic style that looks like this. Day and nighttime, time in bed, have been increasing for the past five days. Many instances yesterday had low pulse rate, and many instances yesterday had low respiration rate. 
So this is part of a, a new study that we're running that's funded by the National Library of Medicine where we're going to test these different forms of the alerts and see the effect of that. Just displaying the information in a different way. How are you generating these quantity values? Like what's many versus a uh, lot? Or? That's the trick, yes. Um, this is work that's done by um, actually Jane and, uh, and uh, Jim Keller, Dr. Keller. Can you guess? I, I, I figured, but I wanted to hear. <laughs> and um, uh, actually, to be honest with you, whoops, to be honest with you, they, oh, what did I do? <laughs> they, t they don't have a paper out on that yet, but um, if you look at the paper that I just mentioned here, um, this EMBC 2015 paper, that has the preliminary work for this, and then they'll be developing a new paper. I told them I would just give you guys teasers. Mm -hmm. But this is using fuzzy logic, or did they use some other techniques? Um, no, I think it's still using fuzzy logic. Yes, yeah, it's a it's a qualitative you know, qualitative form of this. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, do you have anything so for voice or conversation? I'm sorry. What? Do you have any sensor for recording voice? No, we, we aren't using that. I know that there are some people that are using voice and recording uh, or, or, or capturing the inflection of the voice and the strength of the voice and other, the timbre of the voice. Yeah, that would, that, I can imagine that that would be an interesting sensor to add. So um, thank you all. You've been very uh, patient. Uh, here's a list of many of our collaborators and, of course, We've had many students and study subjects over the years. Lots of different disciplines are represented here. And here is um, a more recent picture of Lou and Marianne that was just taken in August when Dad celebrated his 96th birthday. So Mom is 93. They're still in their own home. I don't know how long they're going to be in their own home, but they're still in their own home. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention.